Good morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So good to see all of you here gathered this morning, and a special welcome to our visitors. If you would, take a second to sign the friendship pads and pass those down so we can take note of who's worshiping with us today. And also just a quick note that uh, the offering plates are in the back of the sanctuary and there are prayer cards back there. If you fill out a prayer card or pledge card, you can place those in the plates as you come and go from the sanctuary at the beginning or end of service. So during the time of reflection, instead of passing the offering plates, we, we get to sit and contemplate about the message or about our lives, about God's love for us or about where we are in life. So it, it creates a space of sitting still. And, and just being, which I have a feeling that a lot of us don't get to do that often. So we, we've created this kind of intentional space for you to just be and be in the presence of God and the Holy Spirit for just a, just a few moments. We have several announcements for today. Um, first, thank you to the choir. So for all the stuff you've done, all the music you've provided, all the special things you've done, Marge isn't here today. She's off traveling. She's in Oregon going down the Snake River, and uh, Marlene's filling in on the Oregon. But thank you guys for all the great <laughs> leadership. So we'll be doing special music throughout the summer. Uh, we have a, a bees game coming up on June 23rd and July 14th, and we just go general admission, sit over on the third base side, and anyone is welcome to join us. Just come out, find a group uh, that's sitting there. It's usually myself and Sarah and some, some other families, and, and we, have a, we have a good time and watch the bees. We also have VBS coming up very quickly. The theme this year is Washed in Water out at the Kramer's Farm, June 10th through 14th. There are registration forms in the office if you haven't registered your kids yet already. It's filling up and there's limited space, so please do so to make sure that your kids can get in. We also need counselors and training to help, so if your kids are uh, rising 6th grader, 7th graders, 8th graders through high school, we, we use some of those to, to help us uh, with the, with the younger ones, too, and do some special devotion time for them. We have our Presby 101 class next Sunday. This is the class for anyone who is interested in learning more about the Presbyterian Church, the Peace USA as a whole, some of our history and tradition, some of the things we've done nationally, as well as to learn a little bit more about the mission and vision of this particular church and to get connected with some other people inside the church. So, uh, if if you're new here or if you've been here 20 years but you were Catholic and or Methodist or Lutheran or nothing and you don't know much about it, come and, and learn a little bit more about the Presbyterian Church and get connected with folks. So that'll be after church next Sunday. And then we have the Presbyterian Women's Spring Fling coming up Thursday, June 6th at 1 p.m. So if if you are interested in coming to that it'll be here uh, down in the fellowship hall so please come and then we have our summer sacks lunch lunches coming up over the fellowship cup th the weeks of june 24th and july 1st and this is the program where we make sack lunches for the kids who are on free and reduced lunches at the schools because they don't get lunches during the summertime so we make sure that they're still getting fed and it's a way for us to give back in our community so if you're inter interested in that i believe there's a sign up out on the table or patty madden would you throw your hand up in the air there's patty right over there she can she can help you she's one of the organizers yeah and then we have the social justice class that will be meeting today and they will be talking next week Next week, says Bob. Uh, next week, June 9th, uh, and, and they'll be meeting in Peter's room next week because we'll be down in the fellowship hall for the Presby 101 class. And so if you're, if you're into the social justice stuff, they'll be doing some, some neat topics in there. And so that'll be next, next week. Are there any other announcements today? Okay. Well, welcome. We're glad you're here. Let us center our hearts and minds to worship God. I'm just a florist. Got a small shop. Nothing special.
Silly way to spend your life, I guess, fussing with a bunch of flowers. Sometimes I wish I was good at something else. I don't know, a doctor or a missionary. Someone who really helps people. But I do love flowers. I always had an act for it. So I do my best to make them beautiful for people. But I know flowers can't change the world. I know I don't make much of a difference. I'm just a florist. I'm just a florist. Let us stand as we are able for the call to worship. We have been called to be a witness to the way of Christ in the world. What words can we use? What stories can we tell? We can point to the fruits of the Spirit revealed through Christ and say, See, those are the will of God for our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, forbearance and self-control. May our worship today lead us more and more into the will of God for our lives. Amen.
be seated. Although God has given the church the message of reconciliation in and through Jesus Christ, we fall short of God's call to be salt of the earth and light of the world. Let us confess the ways in which we do not follow God's call. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you like Adam and Eve, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us continue to confess our personal sins in silence. the good news of God's promise. Romans 5 says, if all died through one human Adam, then how much more blessed is the promise that Jesus, our true God, saved all of humanity. The curse is broken. We are called now to wipe away tears and alleviate pain since our tears and pain have been redeemed. Friends, believe this good news. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, healed, and sent to serve. Thanks be to God. Amen. be seated. God of all wisdom, please join me for the prayer. God of all wisdom, today I pray that I can quiet my restless mind so that I may hear about the way of Christ in the world. As I hear, O Lord, then may your word become a light for my path in life. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The first lesson this morning is from Acts, verses, Acts 1, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, Theopolis, in the first book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father, 
This he said is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
you. Our New Testament lesson for today comes from the 24th chapter of Luke, verses 44 through 53. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to all of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. After they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. The words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we have three holy Sundays in a row the next couple of weeks. Today is the Ascension. Next week is Pentecost. And the following week is Trinity Sunday. Exciting, isn't it? So truly, I know that most likely you weren't doing the dishes or cutting the grass or shopping at the grocery store while wondering in your mind about the doctrine and dogmas of the faith, like the divine perichoriosis of the Trinity. If you don't know peri, peri Coriosis. It's 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 simple. Peri is a circle. Cori is choreographed, and and oshish means what does that mean? <laughs> it's a periographed circle dance of the Trinitarian Godhead, uh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Those are the things that that pastors think about when we're going in circles, cutting the grass. And I'm I'm sure you weren't watching the rain clouds build over the past 40 days and 40 nights and looking up at the clouds and going, and just what happened when Jesus ascended into the clouds? And, and did he really go up? And what happens to the people in China? Is up, down, and down, up? And, and what about now that we have the Hubble telescope? Where does heaven begin and end? And where is the throne? We've looked for it, eh? So I'm sure you weren't thinking about those doctrines and dogmas or, or wondering about while you're vacuuming about how uh, Pentecost uh, split the Eastern and Western churches. And that's why we have a Greek Orthodox and a, and a, and a Roman Western Catholic church. It's because they didn't agree that when Jesus went on high with God, that Jesus and God would send the Holy Spirit because they said, well, that means that the Spirit is subjugated by God and Jesus instead of it being a divine equal dance with no one leading but them dancing together. Now Jesus and God are taking the lead and that's not fair to the Holy Spirit. And so they split. And so they split. And you wonder about how some of our terminology today shapes factions in the church. I, that's what I was thinking about while I was vacuuming. It's, 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 it's very exciting to me that we have three high holy days of dogma and doctrine in the church in a row. <laughs> The truth is, you probably don't give one iota, 
which is a dot or a, a little accent mark on a Greek word, if you didn't know. You don't give one of those little iotas about those things. And the truth is, I spent years in seminary pondering them and mulling them over. I had lunches and dinners and burgers and pizza where we hashed these things out. We ostracized each other for being either too orthodox or too unorthodox. And, and we said, well, you need to think rightly about these things because that's important. When you get into your church, your people are going to care. <laughs> Dogma matters, doesn't it? But let's back up just a minute, though. Let's, let's define dogma before we get too far into this. I know we have some recovering Catholics in here. And so I think it's important for, for Protestants to understand uh, some of the difference between dogma and doctrine. We have doctrine uh, and we have some dogma, even though it may not be as explicit. So here's a good example of, of Catholic dogma that I learned about. So before you could take the Eucharist, uh, before you could take the Eucharist on Sunday morning or Saturday evening, you cannot ingest anything else an hour or 30 minutes before worship. And so I had a friend telling me that when they were kids, they were just look at the clock and the clock's going and it's, and it's about to be 8.30 and they're all eating breakfast as fast as they can. And then right when the clock hits 8.30, mom's like, stop. You can't let anything else interfere with Jesus. And, and that's Vatican II. That's the, that's the laid back version. When it was Vatican I before the 60s, it was the whole day. So from the time you got up, you couldn't ingest anything else so that, that when you took it over. That was one of their uh, doctrines and dogmas about that. Dogma, as defined by Google, is... A principle or set of principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true. It is a teaching, belief, conviction, tenet, principle, ethic, precept, maxim, article of faith, canon, law, or rule. Wikipedia defines dogma in the pejorative sense, saying dogma refers, refers to enforced decisions such as those of aggressive political interests or authorities. More generally, it is applied to some strong belief whose adherents are not willing to discuss it rationally. We're not talking about the Cubs. <laughs> this attitude is named as, dog, as a dogmatic one or as dogmatism and is often used to refer to matters related to religion, but is not limited to theistic attitudes alone, and is often used with respect to political or philosophical dogmas. Which brings me to the point of the title of this series. As we look at these three days of dogma, or three dogma nights, huh? Or, who let the dogma out? <laughs> now, Sarah was very concerned about this and recommended that I not do it. <laughs> she said, don't. And I said, yes, it's a gift from the Holy Spirit. And she said, why don't you ask the PCUSA leaders? We actually have a website of, of leaders of other pastors and theologians. And so I put on there, listen, we have three high holy days coming up. And I was thinking that I would do who let the dogma out. Who, 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 who? And I got about 56 replies. <laughs> and most said, oh, let the spirit roll, right? And, and. Many others said, oh, God, no. <laughs> and then someone suggested, suggested, the concern was people wouldn't get the reference of who let the dogma out. And so someone suggested, well, with a typical Presbyterian congregation, I would imagine that they would much more appreciate three dogma nights. And I said, you know, knowing some of my folks, that might be true. They can sing that song by heart. 
if you don't know how three dog night goes, joy to the world, Jeremiah was a bullfrog, so I was playing it for you beforehand. I didn't want to quite go with the who let the dogs out. I was afraid that you, the dogs might get out. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm gone. But the choir was singing it by heart. You know, it, it, if you weren't here to hear it, it's uh, joy to the world. But y'all can sing it. All the boys and girls, joy to the people in the deep blue sea, joy to you and me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great song. But we're going to talk a little bit more about it. But And, and so the other concern was um, the, the younger folks wouldn't know that song, and the older folks wouldn't know who let the dogma out. They wouldn't get that reference, right? So if I said, who let the dogma out? You would all say, ah, the, who, 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 who? You've heard that. I, have you heard that? Maybe. So it's a song. It's a song. It's an older song. Uh, it, it's my generation, uh, which for the younger generation here is now the older generation. So we're in between all of those things. So if I asked you, who let the dogma out, who, 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 would be the reply, and I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> the next concern about doing this was just how appropriate the lyrics and themes of these songs would be to talk about on a Sunday morning. Not very. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. He was a good friend of mine. He had some very, very, very fine wine, something like that. And I said, communion Sunday. <laughs> it works. It works. And honestly, I just like the play on words with the songs about dog and dogma, and it just kind of worked. But as I looked at these songs and I studied the scriptures and the history of dogma in the church, it really, really, really began to come together and to fit. So the song, Who Let the Dogs Out, is sung from the point of view of some women in a dance club. And they're dancing and they're having a good time and it's a girlfriend party and all this and that. And all of a sudden, all of these guys show up and they start taking over the dance floor and the girls sing out, Who Let the Dogs Out? And they all go, who, 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 who? Because the guys start taking over the party and the girls don't like it. Which, if you know church history, that's exactly what happened. All of these people are running around loving each other, loving Jesus, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, believing kind of willy-nilly whatever they wanted. And then for the first time in the second, late second century, early third century, the church came into political power and all of these guys showed up and said they're having too much fun. We're going to take over and we're going to make some rules. And everyone's like, who let the dogma out? Makes sense, doesn't it? That was an amazing theological turn. I wish we could get Emmys for something like that. They didn't like their good time being ruined by these men. They are the three dogma night. Because if you look at the theme of three dogma night, they are all about doing joy to the world and all the boys and girls, joy to the fishes in the deep blue sea, joy to you and me, and it sounds great. But when we listen to the rest of the song, PG-13, the guy is talking about doing joy in a very do whatever you want, when, whatever you want, whenever you want, in a very hedonistic kind of attitude. It's just whatever goes. And no wonder parents in the 60s and 70s were worried about you all and look how you turned out. When you were listening to this hippie stuff, they were concerned. They wanted control. And if you don't know, the ones who always, always throughout history and the world, the ones who always let the dogma out are the ones who are in control. 
because they know what's best for everybody, right? Absolutely. There's always just one right way to believe. And so the three dogma night people and the three and the who let the dog out people, who let the dogma out people have always, always clashed throughout history. It's always, well, it's free love, give to everybody, do everything for everyone, right? Not in the hedonistic sense. I think we put that aside. But in this very real, hey, we follow the golden rule versus, no, we need to have rules about how we follow the golden rule. And there's always been this idea of free love versus let's control it. It's always been uh, three dogma night, right, free love or Who let the dogma out? We are going to control this party. People are having too much fun. So why does any of this matter for your life when it comes to doctrine and dogma? And specifically, when we think of things like the ascension, about Jesus being taken up from from the earth into the heavens. Well, because we struggle with these things. I know I, as a person of faith, struggle with these things because we have some competing doctrines and dogma within the church and within the culture of Western United States about what exactly are we supposed to believe about these things. And when we think about, well, okay, we've learned a lot about how the world and cosmology works over the past 2,000 years. And we know that if Jesus was taken up on high into heaven, Uh, we should most likely be able to find somewhere Jesus in space, in heaven, right? And so we have literally gone looking everywhere for Jesus. Now, I've seen some nice constellations and solar systems and all that. We used to think that ours was the only, only sun. And then we find out there are multiple suns and all kinds of suns. And, and, And Well, if you try to apply modern sensibilities to figure out how the ascension happened, you are literally going to drive yourself nuts, and you just can't do it. There is no way, and if you keep trying to do that, you're missing the point. Because they were using something physical to point out the truth about something spiritual. They were saying something physical to point to the truth of something spiritual. And what they were saying was that Jesus and God were one. And they joined together as one during the ascension. And that that is the deeper truth of the ascension, that Jesus was the perfect embodiment of God's will on earth. And with his ascension, he is going to be one with God in heaven, right? Heaven being everywhere at all times and all places. And that that is what the ascension means to us today as doctrine and dogma. The point is that Jesus was and is God. When we think about this for our lives, right? About who we know the person of Jesus to be. Someone we can look up to in a in a time and place and in a world where we need someone to look up to. That Jesus is the incarnate will of God. It isn't provable. We can't prove that, but it's acceptable. It's believable. And it's beautiful. And it changes everything. And that's the ABCs of faith. It's acceptable. It's beautiful. It changes lives. It's acceptable as truth where it shows us who God is and it's beautiful because it points to God's ways and how we should live with one another and it changes us when we fall in love with this person of Christ and his ways and how we should live and here's why I think that's important for us today as modern Christians in the United States of America we have two competing dogmas that govern every decision that we make in our lives today. 
two competing dogmas. And you can talk to me later if you don't think this is true. Two competing dogmas of our lives today. One, the golden rule. Do unto others. The other one, radical individualism. And take care of myself first. Two competing dogmas. Do unto others and me first. One says, if I meet someone who is in need and thirsty and dying of quenched dehydration or unquenched dehydration in the desert, I should give them a glass of water because if I was walking through the desert and dying of dehydration, I would want someone to give me a glass of water. That's the golden rule. The other one says, I'm keeping this glass of water for myself or for my family or for my country because I might need it later. That person can survive on their own. And so we spend our lives as modern Christians with those two competing rules, being controlled by two dogmas. And so the question is to you, because I have learned that we can't control you, right? Like those men coming on the dance floor or people telling other people what you have to believe, you have to decide for yourself and then live into your decision of what is dogma for you. What principle in your life are you willing or not willing to compromise on? Which one governs your, governs your life? And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that over the next coming weeks. What are your principles? What is your character? How are you growing into the fruits of the Spirit? So I hope you will join us because we've got some Michael Jackson next week. <laughs> it's going to be good. Speaking in tongues. May God bless these holy words. In Christ's name, amen. Stand and say together what we believe using the affirmation of faith from our newest confession, the Belhar Confession. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through word and spirits. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church the communion of saints called from the entire human family. We believe that unity is therefore both a gift and an obligation for the church of Jesus Christ. We 
believe that this unity must become visible so that the world may believe that separation, enmity, and hatred between people and groups is sin. Therefore, we reject any doctrine that absolutizes the faith in such a way that hinders or excludes any person or peoples from the unity of the church in Christ. Amen. I know it sounds like a Christmas song. You may be seated. I know it sounds like a Christmas song, but that is actually an Easter song originally talking about how Jesus broke the curse of Adam. And when people ask us, how can you have an open table? How can you have an open and inclusive congregation? How can you let just anybody in? And it's because of who Jesus is. We are no longer held bound by a curse, but we are redeemed for love and freedom and to share that with everyone. That's what it means when we say Jesus reigns. And he asks us to come to this table, making it open to all people to share, to share the love of God with everyone so that we are sustained and reminded of this meal. This meal has shaped the lives of believers since the, first, since the first bread was broken with Christ. And since that time, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, our great-grandmothers and great-grandfathers and Sunday school teachers and many others have taken this meal. And we share this meal with them today, eternally. And in years to come, your babies and your children and, and your great-grandchildren will break bread in the same way, and you will celebrate this with them eternally. And this meal also represents a time when peace reigns, when all people are welcomed to one table, and none will be turned away. So this is Christ's table, open for all of you. Let us pray. 
Most holy God, we give you thanks that even though we have turned away from your love and your redemption time and time again, that we choose the ways of the world over and over, you still love us and claim us and send your spirit and your prophets and your words to call us back to the way of Christ, to help us grow in character and in virtue, and to choose to choose good. So we thank you that you offer yourself as a living sacrifice so that we, we can grow and stop living like the walking dead, but live as people who are fully alive. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless this world, that swords would be smashed into plowshares so that the hungry may be fed and that wars may end. We pray, O oh Lord, for the many victims of mass shootings, especially the other one that just occurred this weekend, for the hearts broken and the tragedies felt. We pray, O oh Lord, for the victims of the storms and the tornadoes and the, and the chaotic weather patterns for the farmers and the businesses and the industries that are waiting to do their work. And we pray for this community as teachers end the school year and, and celebrate a little rest and recuperation. We give you thanks for the dedication that they've given to the kids as they teach them how to be good community members. We pray for the life of this church and this congregation as we seek to join in fellowship, love one another, and serve you. We ask that you continue to help us share your love, shine your light, and be shaped as your people. We ask this in Christ's name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took the loaf of bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the forgiveness of all sin. Drink this in remembrance of me. Friends, it is truly a mystery that Christ's body broken can make us whole, and that his blood spilled can fill us up with the Holy Spirit. This is the feast of God for the people of God. Today we will celebrate communion by intention. We would ask that you would come forward to one of the two stations, rotating clockwise. And so all is ready. Would you please come forward?
let us give God thanks in prayer. Let us pray. Most holy God, we thank you for this meal that reminds us of your hope and sustains us with your presence. We ask, O oh Lord, that your peace be known from this meal throughout the world and that one day we can truly all sit at one table as one people made in your image. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, go from this place and hold on to what is good. Return, O person, evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be known to you and those you love now and forever. Amen. <laughs>